Gregory Peck speaking. And I'd like to tell you something about the guns of Navarone, because it's the most unusual film in which I've ever appeared. I play the role of Mallory, the man whose job it is to lead six expert cutthroats and saboteurs on a desperate and impossible mission. Watch out! What makes it even more desperate and impossible is that some of us hate each other even more than we do the enemy. The Guns of Navarone is crowded with action and excitement, but it is even more than great adventure. Over and above its tremendous thrill, this is a story of human beings, each with his intense personal fears, his deep personal conflicts, each with his moments of triumph and tenderness. This is a story of unrivaled courage. Easter. And suspense. The Guns of Navarone, I promise you, is probably the most exciting film you will ever see. Carl Foreman sent me the script. And I liked it immediately. I mean, it was a very, very well-constructed tale, an adventure tale. We always thought of it as an adventure story rather than a serious war picture. And uh, I liked it right away. I said, yeah, I want to do it, and uh, let the agents uh, thrash out the deal, and uh, let's go. Doing a big picture like that was an enormous experience. There was, I, I don't want to mention his name, but there was a director, the, the first director, started the picture. And he and uh, he had a meeting with uh, Greg Pick and David Ivard, myself, and told us what he intended to do with the picture. And we were very happy that he talked to us about what he saw in the story. And then... Um, we went out the first day, and he said, uh, Greg and David, just a second, I'm, I'm, I'm lining up a shot. Can you have, the boat was about 15 miles away. He says, tell the boat there to move three inches to the right. <laughs> Greg and I looked at each other and David, and we knew he wasn't going to direct the picture. Carl and I sat in the projection room for several days, looking at various, the work of various directors. Uh, and many directors, in fact. Greg was not aware of my work in, in Britain, uh, and he had the right of director, like all the big stars have, and so he wanted to see a couple of my films before uh, he agreed for me to direct the film. The reason we agreed on, on uh, Lee was that he directed something very small and rather sensitive character portrayal. It was called Tiger Bay with, I believe, Haley Mills. And he'd also directed one of those uh, on the Indian frontier with uh, Gurkhas and all that, and uh, a lot of battles. And so he obviously was able to handle the dynamics of action scenes. And it seemed to us to be the perfect combination, the sensitivity, the respect for character on the one side, and the ability to direct action uh, and to keep the thing moving and keep the, keep the frame exciting all the time. And he took over, he took over magnificently and uh, had the script about four or five days before shooting began. And uh, it was a kind of a remarkable accomplishment and achievement for him to take over with a, pro a production that had been in preparation about a year or more. Like when I direct, I get real kind of uptight to use, to use a, a, a term that's maybe not too flattering, but that's what happens to you. You, you get real 
there's so much pressure on you as a, as a director to, to finish these scenes within the allotted time. He had a little piece of paper rolled up in his back pocket and said, wait, 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 I've got the paper somewhere here. I, I haven't read the script yet, uh, gentlemen, but, uh, uh, oh yeah, here's this. Um, yes, yes, it says that Greg stands over there, uh, Mr. Niven over here, and Anthony, you, you stand there, and you start the scene. We, uh, everybody looked at each other and said, geez, one page man, <laughs> with a crumpled old page in his hip pocket. He never lost that piece of paper. Never said, I haven't read the whole script yet. I, I, I read, of course, he knew the script better than anybody. Hello? Gia Scala, the Italian actress, who I'd had in the film before I made The Guns of Never. Gia was in a film I made for Columbia called I Aim at the Stars. She was excellent in that film, but she was an eccentric person. Anna! You're limping. Are you hurt? You need help? I remember one day I was walking by J. Lee Thompson's cabana or bungalow. Gia had been cutting his hair. She had cut the back of his hair. She said, I can do a wonderful job. And this was on location in the island of Rhodes. And I sat down in the chair and she uh, began to simply take all my hair off. And I walked in and he was facing the mirror. And I looked at it and I thought, my wife was with me, and I looked at it and I thought, my God, she ruined the back of his head. I mean, she just shaved all the way up the back of his head. And, and he said, how does it look? And I said, and Gia looked at me, and I looked at her, and she did one of those things. I said, well, it looks fine. And what, of course, it didn't. So every morning, what happened was, after he had realized what, what she had done, every morning, before going to the set, he would stop by my bungalow. Jay Lee would stop it. And I would make up the back of his head <laughs> with pencil, with, you know, uh, eyebrow pencil and makeup so you couldn't see what she did because she just took it and just shaved right up the back of his head. Made a terrible mess of it. And uh, I suspect for some odd reason she did it deliberately. J. Lee Thompson wanted, wanted uh, Gia to cut her hair for the, for the film. Gia did not want to cut her hair for the film. She wanted to just put her hair up. But he wanted it to be like, like a, a man's haircut, so you would think it was a man uh, when she was first discovered. And she didn't like that one bit. And now she had this great opportunity to, to get even. It's bad that this happened to her. Which of you did this? Well, uh... I'm afraid it was me. Irene Pappas is a, is a wonderful, wonderful actor. And Irene gives a lot. She's very emotional when she, when she works. And uh, it was wonderful because she gave me a lot, and, I, and it was easy for me to return it, you know. I must say one thing, she hits hard. What did you do that for? To remind you to write letters occasionally. <laughs> there happens to be a war on. I mean before the war. I promised myself I would do this the first time I ever saw you again. I'm sorry, brother. <laughs> Jimmy Darren was a, really, in a way, a bit of a risk to play because he had never done any big international film and he was known as a very fine pop singer and uh, had done many concerts and cabaret performances. But in this film, he really came to the front as an actor, and he played magnificently. He's continued to do very well and is a good friend of mine. Anthony Quinn was an absolute delight to work with, as was the whole cast. Was a man who, when I uh, was a little uh, leery of saying, please don't do it, that way, 
or he could see that I was, was not exactly high on his interpretation, he would get quite angry and say, I'm a bargain basement. Don't you understand? I have wares to sell. I can do a scene a thousand ways. Stehen Sie auf. Stehen Sie auf. Stehen Sie auf, bevor Sie sich verkotzen. Get up. Get up. Rouse. Rouse, Mr. Bogenfall, your left hand stinkt. I'm sick. Please, I'm sick. I'm sick. I'm sick. Just tell me what you want and I'll show you. I'll go on showing you until you're happy. And you cannot. What a performance. <laughs> <laughs> Any way you want it, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, you know, I have tremendous respect for good, uh, for good directors. Good directors are very few and far between. And Thompson was a wonderful, 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 inspirational director. And I wanted to please him. He's, he's the only audience you have. So I said, absolutely, I'll do it any way you want. And that was Quinn. He could play a scene a hundred different ways, and many of them quite brilliant. Very often it was hard to choose between his interpretations. But that was the uh, crux of how we worked together. There was Gregory Peck and David Niven and Anthony Quayle. And there was Stanley Baker and, and uh, Anthony Quinn. So there were two camps, so to speak. And I was, the, I was the ping pong ball or the pawn who went from camp to camp. You know, I mean, that was sent to this camp and sent to that camp. So I, I was the kid. I beg your pardon, sir, but this is the first chance I've had to talk to you more or less alone. I don't want to be left out anymore. I just want to be part of the team again. Please give me a chance. You can trust me. I'll think it over. Greg Peck and, uh, and, and David Niven were very close friends. And um, I don't think they approved of, of Stanley. I mean, they, 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 or I know, they didn't approve of me because I, I wore a red shirt. And they were a little disturbed by the red. I don't know why. Tony was wearing a red undershirt beneath his, his, his fisherman costume and his and it was rather drab as I remember his uh, we were all dressed in, in drab clothes had to change into a, a German outfit and uh, so I mean I knew that I had to go through many changes in the, the script and I myself never wanted to so I, I kept notes on the scenes and what I was wearing when he began to roll his sleeves back a few inches and show a bit of the red undershirt. Uh, we had no idea what, what he was planning to do. Uh, when he rolled them up a little higher, uh, and, we, and of course we didn't shoot in sequence, so that Tony had to have studied this continuity very carefully. Uh, so that he would he would match from one scene to another as to the degree of red that he was showing. My father was a cameraman. One thing I'm very much aware is of time, and, and, and I, I plan costumes or whatever it is. So we didn't pay much attention to this gradual unfolding of red that Tony was engaged in. Uh, we thought, well, the script girl knows what she's doing and he'll, she'll tell him if he's not matching. So finally, a lot of red was showing in the undershirt too. But in the final scene of the picture, when I fished him out of the water in a very drab gray set, gray green set when, at, at night, when the water was dark, the, the whole surroundings were dark. Come on, man, take it. Grab it. Finally, Tony emerged in a full red undershirt. And now, <laughs> now we knew what he was up to. <laughs> uh, and he planned that very carefully. I, I didn't do anything <laughs> outlandish in the picture. I just was a Greek, that's all. 
I love Tony dearly, and uh, we've made uh, three pictures together, and usually we're at each other's throats, sometimes over a girl, sometimes over politics, but we seem to be always cast uh, uh, as uh, antagonists. But uh, I love Tony. I wish I could work with him again. Shepparton was the studio that I did all the main work in all the sets and the guns were built on the back lot at Shepparton. In, in London, we had two huge sound stages filled with water in a mock-up of the ship that, were on, uh, that was on hydraulic lifters and moved all over the place and airplane engines blowing water that was, uh, that was shot into the engines with fire hoses and tanks dropping tons of water. Thompson warned us, he says, you know, we're doing this for the first time, this huge wave uh, hits the boat and you and Niven and Greg are out there and you're they were discussing what to do in this storm. We had scuba, guy, scuba uh, people in the water, in scuba gear with tanks and everything, uh, because it was quite treacherous. It was really dangerous. Tony, would you stand in there? And Greg, Greg says, of course I would. And David, oh, yes, of course. Everybody was, was a little frightened because you couldn't hear anything. You couldn't see anything. They sent these tons of water down. Gregory was washed overboard and uh, went under the ship, and I remember he cut, he cut his head. I mean, the boat was, like as I said, on hydraulic lifters, and had he been in a position where the ship had, had come down, I mean, he could have been crushed. And then suddenly we looked around, and David Divin wasn't there, so I knew he'd fallen in the... In the Overboard, and I went down, and Greg, I think, went on the other side for him. I found him. His, his coat had caught down in the machinery of, of, of the boat, and he. And, and I, I went down to the coat and helped him to a turn, and we came up. So it was pretty, uh, it was pretty hairy at, at, at some points, believe me. It was just. Uh, it was fun doing, but when you couldn't hear, and you couldn't see, and you had no idea when this water was going to hit you. That was pretty frightening. But it was not a strange moment to think that you're drowning and your friend is drowning with you. They dumped a lot of water on us, yeah. Well, that's normal. I've had <laughs> I remember one time I was at the, the one end of the ship, and this water hit me and just washed me, and I'm floating down on this bed of water and David Niven was David Niven was holding onto a barrel and I went by him and he, he waved at me as I went by. <laughs> but it was a terrible pounding to take about 10 tons of water coming over. On days like that you sip a little brandy here and there. Keeps you warm. Quinn and Gregory began playing chess together. David Niven and Greg and I and Jimmy and I think Baker and Quayle, we were all out there. Yeah, it was wonderful. Quinn, I must say, won most times. 
but Greg was very competitive and really began to improve his game during the uh, shooting of the film. While the lights were being prepared and the camera was being set up, uh, we were running from our chess game to get to be in a scene and out again. And they all began playing and some of the crew who weren't working began playing. So when I'd walk on the set, I'd see nothing but an array of chess boards with people huddled over it playing chess. And it was almost as if we were in a chess tournament, not making a film. And it's interesting because uh, uh, Thompson spoke to him about what a contribution I had made, not as an actor, but as a social uh, person that I taught them how to get together. And we all became, it's interesting, yes, we became a unit. We became a unit through this chess game. That's right, yes. It became obvious that Tony Quinn was the best chess player. He went through us all. And as a matter of fact, he probably won't admit to this, but I beat him once. And uh, Stanley Baker and Carl Foreman were really razzing Tony. They were just coming on him like crazy. And I took the move back, and then Tony, Tony beat me. There was a, the news of, 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 of the imminent visit of, of David Niven's son, Jamie. Now, Jamie was said to be a very good chess player. When he arrived, he quickly defeated uh, me and uh, Jimmy Darren and Lee Thompson. So we were all primed and ready for the big chess match between David Niven's 14-year-old kid and Tony Quinn. So the day came finally when it couldn't be avoided any longer. And we were out on location somewhere. And again, we were walking into the scene and back to the chess set. And the kid beat Tony. And we were all so happy about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm beaten now by my... Uh, 30-year-old son, Lorenzo, he beats me. I, I can't compete with him anymore, so it depresses me. But I'm teaching my three-year-old, whom I still can beat, thank the Lord that I can still beat him, so I have someone to, to, to teach and to beat. I, it's not the, the beating. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful game. It certainly wiled away the time while... Uh, Ozzy Morris was perfecting his lighting, which often took some time. Good evening, gentlemen. W one day we had the honor of having uh, uh, the king and queen of Greece visit the set. King Paul and uh, Queen Frederica and their two daughters, uh, they both became queens. And they were, at that time, they were teenagers. If you've seen any still pictures, you see this long, long table of all of us uh, uh, dining with, these, these, with royalty, for sure. And it was a very pleasant afternoon, and we also managed to do, do some work along with the royal visit. Uh, the aftermath, uh, they all said they wanted to be in the picture. Uh, well, we couldn't quite arrange that, uh, but uh, some of them were, uh, a couple of them were extras in the cafe scene in the background. Give up quietly, gentlemen, unless you want a great many innocent people killed as well as yourselves. I have met heads of state, including a premier of China, if you can believe that, a certain French president, a certain American president, and a king or two here and there. They all tell me when they meet me, they say, Guns of Navarone is my favorite film. I watch it over and over on the television. So I've, I wondered about that. I'm delighted, of course, but I, figure, I figured that they too have to meet a series, series of challenges, obstacles in their forward moving career careers that have to be overcome. And uh, I, I think they relate to the guns of Navarone for that reason. You're rather a ruthless character, Captain Mallory. 
Well, I didn't think of it back on the cliff. But if I had, I'd have done exactly the same thing. It's the only chance we've got to get the job done. Well, right now, I say the hell with the job. I've been on a hundred jobs, and not one of them's altered the course of the war. There'll be a thousand wars, and there'll be a thousand more until we all kill each other off completely. I don't care about the war anymore. I care about Roy. And if Turkey comes into the war on the wrong side? So what? Let the whole bloody world come in and blow itself to pieces. That's what it deserves. And what about the 2,000 men on Keros? I don't know the men on Keros, but I do know the men on Navarone. And the fact that the film may be shown for many years into the 2000th century gives me a great feeling of warmth. People come up to me constantly on the street uh, at uh, functions saying, oh, my favorite picture comes of Navarone. And it's, 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 it's wonderful. I mean, it's wonderful to be uh, remembered for a, a certain block of your life that you spent, I think, was, we spent about three or four months on the picture, maybe even longer. And I loved every moment of it. I loved being in London, Working with Greg and David and then and, and Lee. But Lee was the head man. I mean, if it hadn't been for Lee, there wouldn't there wouldn't have been a motion picture. Spiro's dead, isn't he? What happened? You forgot why we came here. Everybody mentions the guns in Navarone. Everybody that I've ever met in my life has seen The Guns of Navarone, and they love The Guns of Navarone. It's one of their favorite films of all time. It's on TV quite a bit, so of course, uh, each, each generation has seen it. And uh, it's one of, of the classic films of all time, for sure. Well, the boys on Keros will be happy soon. I'd like to offer you my apologies, sir, and my congratulations. I didn't think we could do it. The truth, neither did I. <laughs> 